Perception and Action Every year since 2005, the Neural Correlate Society convenes a panel of experts across disciplines such as neuroscience, cognitive psychology, ophthalmology, visual arts, and neurology to make one crucial decision. Who will win the Best Illusion of the Year award? Yes, there's an award for who can create the most original and thought-provoking optical illusion each year, and they get cash prizes for it. And yes, one of the reasons why perception as a field gets any attention at all is because of illusions. Illusions are helpful because they tell us about how our brain uses shortcuts to understand the information it's receiving from the world, saving up on resources and processing time along the way. Perception as a field of study then ties to connect how external stimuli become electrical signals in our neural networks and ultimately the conscious experiences that serve as the material for our memory, knowledge, and higher cognitive processes. But if you try to tell anyone how perception works, they'll likely grumble and tell you, I just want my illusions, okay? Until 2015 came and perception was thrown into the limelight when the black, blue, or yellow gold dress captured the internet's attention and people look to perception researchers for answers. So, across three studies and one review in the journal Current Biology, researchers found that things such as age, sex, and life experiences influence what colors you ended up seeing in the desk. We knew for the longest time that we don't always see eye to eye, but what surprised us the most is that sometimes, what we see is not what's in the world in the first place. Perception is a complex process. When you go perceiving the world, you don't just look, touch, smell, hear, or taste things then go, I perceive. There's actually a lot of physiological and psychological processes that bridge the external world to your internal interpretation of it. That's why we have to first differentiate sensation from perception. Sensation is how your nervous system transforms and represents stimuli into receptor potentials and electrical signals that can enter neural processing. If you look at your phone right now, your brain can't actually do anything about it. You can't shove it into your brain or inject it into your nerves. Instead, your eyes pick up on the pattern of light reflected by the phone, which activate photoreceptors in your eye, which transform light into electrical energy. That the brain can do something about. Now that you have electrical signals in your brain, you have to make sense of it. That's where perception comes in. Your conscious awareness of stimuli you attended to, including how you interpret, recognize, integrate, and act responsibly toward them. Another way to look at the relationship between stimuli and our perceptions is the seven-stage general perceptual process. The first two stages look at how we deal with the stimuli we want to perceive. We have to distinguish between the distal stimulus, or the object we're perceiving, and the proximal stimulus, or the form of energy or informational medium through which we perceive the distal stimulus. Going back to the phone example, our visual system doesn't work with the original object but with the pattern of light through photons that our eyes receive. Similarly, audition or hearing works because of sound waves, gustation or taste and olfaction or smell through chemicals reaching our tongue and nose, and some aesthetic senses including touch, temperature, position, and balance through how our skin vibrates or muscles touch as we move. Because of those, we say that sensation and perception follow two principles. First, in the principle of transformation, we've seen that the original stimulus changes in form a lot of times before we consciously perceive it. It transforms from its original form to light, sound, or chemical patterns, to electrical impulses in our nerves to activation in the brain until it becomes conscious experiences so far down the line. Because of this, we say in the principle of representation that how we perceive things depends not on the original stimulus itself, but on how they are formed in our sensory receptors and patterns of brain activity. So, when you look at your phone, it's not because the phone went inside your head. It's because your eyes picked up on light, your nerves fired, your brain took it apart into color and form, and your conscious perception put it back together again. Because of how we've been discussing the sensory system, you might have guessed that the next two stages have something to do with the physiology of perception. Indeed, the distal and proximal stimulus is transformed and represented into electrical signals through the process of transduction, which occurs in the receptors of your different senses. Then, it moves from your sensory organs to and across the brain through neural processing. 
Now that we're inside the brain, it's time to unpack the electrical signal set by the senses to the last three interconnected stages of psychological behavior. In perception, we become consciously aware that the stimulus is present, but it takes recognition to actually give meaning to what you perceive by putting it into a category. Finally, we act on the information our senses give us. If your phone screen lights up, receptors in your eyes convert that light into electrical signals which travel through your nerves until it gets to your brain. Then, once you perceive and recognize that it is your phone, you can decide to pick it up and see if you have any new notifications. You then re-perceive and re-recognize because the act of looking at and picking up your phone changes the pattern of light your eye receives. So, the process continues on. And the amazing thing is that this seven-stage cycle happens in milliseconds, thus allowing you to act quickly whether in checking for phone notifications to avoid speeding vehicles when crossing the road. You better thank your senses, nervous system, and brain that they're working fast all the time to keep you alive. But there's one more thing that enters into the general perceptual process. Your previous knowledge, which includes your memories, expectations, motivations, and emotional states. All of these can influence how you perceive and recognize stimuli around you. For example, if you know that you're going to receive an important phone call today, you're more likely to be attentive and you'd end up misperceiving and misrecognizing random lights and noises as phone notifications. And that's a good thing because your brain takes your goals and contexts into consideration when running through the perceptual process. Also, that's why people can end up seeing and hearing things that aren't there, because the brain listens to your experiences when interpreting stimuli it receives. Going back to the ghost example in our last lesson, we can misperceive and misrecognize the sound of floorboards creaking and random specks of dirt floating around as signs of an apparition if you expect to find the ghost where you are. We can fail to hear what another person is saying if we believe that they're lying. We can say that a dish tastes and smells horrible, but at the same time be a delicacy for some people because it is part of their culture. Our perceptions are not based directly on the stimuli in the world around us, but on representations that can be colored by our knowledge and context. The dress may actually be black and blue in real life, but it matters so much more how our experiences and individual differences fundamentally shape our perceptions. To understand what we are perceiving, we rely on knowledge both inside our heads and outside in the world. We will look at how perception is a complex process. It has to be complex because the world we are perceiving is quite confusing as well. First, when stimuli get transformed into electrical signals, our receptors end up with representations that are ambiguous. As the inverse projection problem demonstrates, when looking at a scene from a particular viewpoint, Two things that look similar could actually be different, and two things that are actually different can be the same. Also, the same object can look drastically different depending on how we look at it. It just happens that humans have viewpoint invariance, or the ability to recognize an object despite viewing it from different perspectives. Finally, the world is not a 2D platformer where everything exists on the same plane. Instead, we're in a 3D open exploration universe where objects can be hidden or blurred depending on how near or far away they are from us. So, how does our perceptual system solve this? We follow five principles. First and second, combine the related, separate the unrelated. Use the characteristics of a stimuli to group free floating features based on the objects that own them, and split these features into separate objects and apart from the overall scene. Third, use what you know. If the object or scene is complex or vague, use your experiences to make best guesses on what you're actually perceiving. You can be wrong, but it's your best shot at accuracy. Fourth, avoid accidents. Make sure that your perception holds up regardless of what viewpoint or perspective you're taking, because you can end up misperceiving the object or scene if you're looking from the wrong place. Finally, fifth, seek consensus and avoid ambiguity. There are many possible interpretations brought about by your perspective and the bias of your knowledge, so identify which one among them is the most accurate or appropriate. Now that we know what our perceptual system does to help us get reasonably accurate interpretations of the world, we should also know, how does the system work? For this, researchers have presented two groups of approaches on how we perceive objects and entire scenes, as well as their relative positions through their depth and size. As we've introduced in the first lesson, 
Bottom-up or data-driven processing helps us perceive the world by picking up on information provided by the stimuli we're sensing. The theories in this group believe that the world actually gives us a lot of data to work with, so all we have to do is to look around and let the stimuli explain for themselves what we're seeing. Knowledge may be important to help us organize our sensations later on, but for the most part, stimuli are meaningful enough to not need any clarification. One of the most renowned researchers adopting this stance is American psychologist James J. Gibson, who proposed in his ecological theory of perception that there is enough rich sensory information in the natural environment for recognition to take place without the need for higher cognitive processing. He calls this direct perception, direct because there's no need for cognition in between, we just look and we immediately perceive. His theory covers a lot of phenomena regarding how we perceive the patterns of reflected light in the environment, the motion of moving objects across our visual field, and the structure of information as we ourselves navigate the world. One important principle he introduced is invariant information. Though we said that how objects look can change depending on how we look at it, there are pieces of information in the world that stay the same, or are invariant, even when we move around. Among these are the depth and size cues, which we use to judge how large or far away objects are. Depth and size cues come in many categories. Monocular cues work even when using just one eye, while binocular cues need both eyes. Monocular cues also have many types. Oculomotor cues rely on how your eye muscles change shape depending on the distance of the object you're looking at. In accommodation, your eye muscles tense up to focus on nearby objects, so you know an object is far away if you don't feel eye strains. You can feel this for yourself by looking at the tip of one of your fingers from an arm's length away, then slowly bringing it closer to one of your eyes until the fingertip becomes blurred and you can't focus on it anymore. You'd notice that the closer the finger is to your eyes, the more it hurts to focus. Meanwhile, convergence and divergence are binocular oculomotor cues. When your eyes are divergent or parallel to each other, the object you're focusing on is far away. Try this again by looking at your finger from a distance using both of your eyes. When you bring it closer to your face, you'd feel your eyes turn inward or converge onto the same point and it would make you feel a greater stain the closer your finger is. Another group of monocular cues are categorized as pictorial because you can see them at work even when looking at a 2D picture, like paintings or photographs. Objects appear farther away from there, covered or obstructed by another object, in occlusion or interposition, closer to the horizon in relative height, and take up a smaller amount of space compared to another instance of the same object, which is the same size, based on relative size. Based on perspective convergence, you can draw parallel lines over an image and see that they converge into the vanishing point in the distance. Like in relative size and height, objects closer to the vanishing point and smaller than similar objects of the same size in reality are perceived as farther away. Also, because of impurities and other particles in the air, objects appear to be bluish and covered by haze when they're distant, following atmospheric perspective. Finally, in texture gradient, objects appear to be grainy, become difficult to discriminate, and seem more closely packed due to smaller spacing when viewed from far away. Motion-produced cues occur over time because the object has to be in motion for them to work. Accretion and deletion happen when objects in the foreground and background move with respect to each other. More distant objects are covered by nearer things through deletion and uncovered through accretion. If you want to see this in action, hold your right hand close to your face and your left hand and arms and away so your right hand covers the left hand. To accrete the left hand, tilt your head to the left and you'll see your left hand emerging from behind. Then tilt your head back to the right for the left hand to be deleted. You can now put down your hands and show your friends a new dance will be discovered. Looming is best described by imagining or actually throwing a ball. When you throw a ball away from you, you notice that it gets smaller in size because it goes into the distance. On the other hand, when the ball is thrown just beside your head, you would notice that it grows in size slightly faster on the side of the ball farthest away from you. If the ball is growing in size equally across all parts, it is moving directly toward you. You should duck 
because it will hit you flatly on your face. You might have experienced the last two motion-produced cues during your last car or bus ride. In motion parallax, objects farther away move slower across the visual field than those on the foreground. So, if you remember your last ride, you'd remember that objects closest to you by the road move past faster than the speed of light, especially on an overspeeding vehicle, while the buildings, mountains, and other things in the distance appear as if they're not moving at all. Gradient of flow works on a similar principle, but this time, look directly in front toward where the vehicle is going. Objects that are farther away, in what we call the focus of expansion, seem as if they are static. Meanwhile, things closer to you on your side move past you very quickly. So, if you are in a tunnel with those yellow and black painted arrow directions, you'd notice that the arrows in the distance are relatively still, but those close to you when you look at your sides blur into each other. Meanwhile, binocular disparity, another binocular cue, refers to how our left and right eyes look at the same scene yet view the world from slightly different angles. You can see this for yourself by again taking your finger and holding it at arm's length. Next, look at it using your left eye with the right closed, then the right with the left closed, and quickly alternate between the two eyes. You'll notice that your finger appears to jump, and that's because your eyes are indeed looking at your finger from two viewpoints a few millimeters apart. Now, when you take the same finger, put it just a thumb's distance away from your eyes, and repeat this process, you'll see that the jumping is much more noticeable. So, following binocular disparity, objects that are farther away look quite similar and don't move as much when viewed using either eye. Finally, size-based cues tell us how large objects are based on how much space they occupy in our visual field. In visual angle, Distant objects take up a smaller space and angle in our retina. To demonstrate this, hold up your finger again a thumb's length away from your face and use the thumb and pointer finger of your other hand to mark the length of your first finger. Without moving your second hand, move the first finger to arm's length away from you. You'd notice that your finger is getting smaller and your thumb pointer finger measure could now cover your entire first hand. So, following size constancy, you know that your finger is not really shrinking. It remains the same constant size, just that moving it into the distance decreases the amount of space and visual angle it occupies in your visual field. What these depth and size cues demonstrate is that, as Gibson argues, you didn't need knowledge to interpret how far or how large an object is. You already know them and use them every day. All we did in these demonstrations is to define what's happening but these cues need no explanation or cognition for them to work. Another characteristic that objects possess is color, which doesn't require knowledge for us to interpret. Put another way, color is how we perceive the wavelengths of light reflected by an object and is given meaning based on what receptors in our eyes are activated. Colors can be chromatic, having hue, the primary wavelength light has, brightness or value, and saturation or its richness and purity, or achromatic, black, white, and gray, which differ only in brightness. Colors can also be spectral, being on the electromagnetic spectrum, or non-spectral, like white, black, and purple, which are not. Yes, purple may be on the rainbow, but it is not on the electromagnetic spectrum, being a mix of red and blue, which are on opposite ends of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, how do we perceive color? We're able to do so at two levels. At the back of our eye is a layer called the retina, which has a lot of photoreceptors. Some are called cones, which can detect color under bright lighting, and others are rods, which can detect vague forms and motion even under poor lighting conditions. The first theory of color vision, the dichromatic theory, works at this level and says that we have three types of cones which are sensitive to three ranges of wavelengths of light. Long, roughly red to orange, medium, around green, and short, mostly blue. When you see an object that reflects a particular wavelength of light, the cone that is sensitive to that range of wavelengths becomes active, and this tells the brain that you saw a particular color. This free cone system is why, in color mixing, it only takes red, green, and blue to create all the other colors you can see. Color mixing can be additive, combining the wavelengths of all the base colors, as in mixing light, or subtractive permitting only the wavelengths shared by all base colors, like in paint. 
That's why computer monitors and concert stage lights use the RGB color scheme, where all three combined result in white. Meanwhile, printers and painters sell ink and other coloring agents in cyan, magenta, yellow, black, or CMYK scheme because cyan, magenta, yellow added together make black. Or at least when you play with clay or watercolor, a very awful dark color. The second level of color vision occurs at the brain, where cones ultimately send what information they receive. At this level, opponent process theory says that we have three types of neurons that are sensitive to pairs of wavelength ranges, roughly equivalent to red-green, blue-yellow, and black-white. That's why in illusions called color after images, where you look at the picture of a familiar image but with inverted colors, the neurons responsible for these inverted colors get tired after staring for a long time, and the corresponding proper color neuron is the only one that can respond when you look at a blank surface, thus leaving you to see a properly colored image floating in space. However, we know that objects can seem to change color under different lighting conditions. Outdoor spaces tend to be more yellowish due to natural lighting, while indoor light bulbs give a bluish tint. Because of this, the brain picks up on what color things tend to be and automatically correct for the changes in lighting tint. That's why we have color constancy for chromatic colors and lightness constancy for achromatic colors. So, our red shirt may be more vividly red under the sun and subdued under LED lights, but our brain knows that it's still the same red shirt and adjusts our perception accordingly. This is also one of the explanations for the death illusion. People's brains tend to resolve the sun's lighting on the desk differently, so the brain can end up skewing perceptions toward either a black, blue, or white blue interpretation. Still, one last issue that the brain has to resolve is that objects can be hidden beneath shadows, so it has to figure out whether objects that appear to have the same color are the same object. For example, the same red shirt can be half in light and half in shadow, but the brain knows that this is the same red shirt because it is an illumination edge. What's changing is the lighting conditions or how much light the object is getting. Meanwhile, a ruby and a scarlet shirt would appear different from each other, and the brain knows this because this is a reflecting sedge. What's changing is how much light the materials themselves are reflecting, meaning it's an entirely different object at that point. Simply, whether looking at color types, mixing, or interpretation, the brain does all the work automatically while not relying much on our knowledge of the color of objects. However, in cases where an object is artificially colored or when we're not sure what shade it really has, our experiences are called on more to resolve any ambiguities. Finally, Gestalt psychologists also proposed a few principles which define how our perceptual system tries to organize the environment into coherent objects and segregate scenes into distinct things. Remember that the Gestaltists were reacting against the assertion by structuralists but conscious experiences can be analyzed and reduced to component parts. As Max Verfimer demonstrated using apparent movement, the whole is different than the sum of its parts. In a study, two lights alternately turning on and off are perceived as just one light moving left and right. Structuralism can reduce this to lateral motion because no motion exists. It is apparent and illusory. So, Gestalt principles emphasize holes of how things are put together and set apart into coherent objects. To put features together, our perceptual system follows the principle of good continuation, where it looks for straight lines or smooth curves that, when connected, would result in smooth and continuous paths. The resulting perception should then follow the principle of good figure, or pregnance, or simplicity, which is the simplest interpretation possible. The other principles also group objects together when they look like each other, or similarity, or near each other, or proximity, occupy the same space, or common region, are connected together while having similar properties, or uniform connectedness, move in the same direction, or common fate, and are perceived to happen close in time and space, or contiguity. Now that objects are grouped together, we also have the ability to distinguish these objects from the backgrounds and context against which they are located. We call this figure ground segregation, 
the thing-like central object, called the figure, is perceived to be in front of a continuous and almost shapeless surface called the ground. The face vase is a reversible figure ground because we can see either the face or vase as a central object. What it's pointing out, though, is whichever we perceive as the figure has border ownership, where the barrier separating the figure and ground is perceived to belong to the object. In illusions and other vague cases such as these, we tend to judge convex regions, those that budge outward, and areas lower in the visual field as the figure. So, sometimes, the faces bulge outward. In other cases, the upper rim of the vase stretches upward, and its base is placed lower in the image. In either case, the face and vase have their own reasons for being perceived as a figure. In daily life, though, things tend to be more clear-cut, so we're more easily able to tell objects apart from the background. In the rare case that we encounter a real-life ambiguous object, Experience does come in to resolve this vague situation and we learn from our interpretation of this specific piece, which then informs how we perceive equally vague objects in the future. Invariant information given by depth and size cues, color, and principles of organization and segregation all take the stance that knowledge is rarely needed to perceive the world. Meanwhile, Top-down or knowledge-driven processing points out that we encounter a lot of ambiguities in what we're perceiving, such that sometimes the stimuli themselves give us mixed signals. So, we use our knowledge to fill in the gaps, decide on which information is relevant, and figure out which among the many interpretations possible results in the most accurate perception. The gist of a scene refers to the pattern of general or overall characteristics of a scene or situation, which you can perceive and identify even when presented for just milliseconds. These characteristics are called global image features, which are rapidly perceived and readily associated with particular scenes. There are many of these, but we'll focus on five. Naturalness is how natural or artificial a scene is. Natural environments tend to have many textures and contours, while artificial ones tend to follow straight, horizontal, and vertical lines. Openness is about the visibility of the horizon and the number of objects present. An ocean would have a clear view of the horizon sparsely populated by waves, while a forest would have a small breathing space and contain a lot of things. Oceans are also low on roughness because it has few small features, while forests would be very rough, being complex and having many things of different sizes. Similarly, oceans show expansion where parallel lines converge in the distance. Forests are low in expansion, while a view of a street looking down a long road would have the street's edges meet in the distance. Finally, scenes have a predominant color scheme. A living forest would be mostly green, a traditional and antique Filipino house would be brown, and the ocean, if we prevent capitalist interests from undermining environmental conservation and long-term sustainability in the endless pursuit of power and greed, is blue. The reason why you're that quick at picking up on these gists and global image features is that you rely on your knowledge to judge what would be typically present in a scene. Your experience of viewing or looking at pictures of these scenes give you a stockpile of information on how to recognize them should you encounter them in the future. These frequently occurring features of the environment are called regularities in the environment and refer either to the structure, called physical regularities, or meaning and function called semantic regularities of the scene. For example, the oblique effect is a physical regularity that shows how we more readily identify horizontal and vertical over diagonal surfaces because of the differences in how common they are in modern architecture. Similarly, because of the light from above assumption, we can interpret indentations and bumps interchangeably based on how shadows should be formed consistent with the lighting source coming from above. Next, as we've seen in attention, scene schemas are a type of semantic regularity because they tell us what we should typically expect in scene, and a violation of that schema will lead us to notice the aberration. Situational scripts, our expectations regarding what we are expected or allowed to do in a particular context, are also semantic regularities that govern our actions. So, the semantic regularities of a classroom would involve chairs, desks, whiteboards, and the expectations that you will be attentive to class discussions. Meanwhile, semantic regularities of jeepneys would include divers, passengers, two entry and exit points by the diver and at the back, and expectations of you passing over the payments of passengers to the diver, and yelling, Para po! 
anxiously because the diver is now two blocks away from where you should have gotten off the vehicle. What we've seen so far is that top-down theories work better in cases where stimuli like clarity, and so we use knowledge to fill in the gaps and help us figure out what's happening when we have vague or insufficient data to make a conclusion. But how does this perception guessing process work? Hermann von Helmholtz proposed that our attempts at making conclusions by relying on assumption and knowledge follows a process of unconscious inference. We're not aware that we're drawing on our previous experiences, but we end up doing so automatically, such that we arrive at inferences quickly and efficiently. Unconscious inference works because of the likelihood principle, which says that we resolve ambiguity by perceiving the stimulus in a way that is consistent with what we think most likely caused the pattern that we observe, based on our encounters with similar situations in the past. For example, you're walking down the street at night, when suddenly, you saw something white, just taller than your shoe in height, rush by your feet. What's that white thing? There are many white, just taller than your shoe things in the world, so how you decide what caused it depends on what other similar things you've encountered in the past. You deem as the most likely cause whichever it is that you have the most experience with. If you happen to pass by a litter of multicolored cats before the white thing passed, you may infer that it's just a cat that rushed by you. Or, if you happen to be approaching the garbage collection area of your barangay, while a strong wind is blowing against your direction, then maybe it's just a plastic bag. Depending on your experiences and the context of your environment, mice, scrap papers, plastic bottles, light fabrics, and white cardboard boxes are all likely because they're consistent with your experiences small and light enough to fly past your feet at that height. Meanwhile, you're likely to dismiss anything else that isn't likely or inconsistent. Babies in all white clothes, a book, a slipper, the moon, a non-corporeal essence compressed into a small white orb. Simply, unconscious inference takes in the vague stimulus, runs fewer experiences for the most likely explanation, and results in a perception that is consistent and best accounts for what you encountered. Finally, the ideas presented in Helmholtz's unconscious inference and regularities in the environment can be formalized into Bayesian inference, a quantitative approach to probabilities named after English statistician Thomas Bayes. Bayesian inference, in the context of perception, tells us that the probability that a particular interpretation of a vague stimulus is true or likeliest depends on two things, our initial belief based on our experiences about how likely an interpretation is true or the prior, and whether the evidence we have is consistent with that interpretation, or the likelihood. Our final conclusion then weighs our prior beliefs against likelihood evidence, and whichever interpretation is most probable will be concluded as the likeliest perception. This process of weighting and calculating happens automatically, as in unconscious inference, such that we're able to judge the probabilities of our perceptions efficiently. Going back to the flying white thing example, your prior beliefs might say that cats and plastic bags are likely, while slippers and non-corporeal essences are not much so. Then, if likelihood evidence shows that a choir of disgruntled meows is upsetting the whole neighborhood, you'd conclude that the cat is most likely, thus boosting your cat prior beliefs while discounting the others. Meanwhile, if you're greeted by footwear thrown haphazardly everywhere, and a child is crying hysterically, accusing all their friends of cheating in the game, Likelihood supports the slipper interpretation despite your low prior for it. The nice thing about Bayesian inference is that it tells us how we update our beliefs and expectations depending on what new evidence comes as we perceive and act in the world. And that's why, combining the bottom-up and top-down approaches, the unified cyclical view of perception says that both directions are important and neither is inherently better, just that one may be more useful depending on the case. Our perceptual system gives us reasonably accurate representations of the world because, following the bottom-up route, the stimuli we have around us are generally rich in information, and we have remarkable sensory systems that effectively and efficiently pick up on these data. At the same time, when we encounter ambiguities and novel situations, the top-down route helps by using our experiences that clarify the incoherent and fill in the incomplete. Together, knowledge inside the head and outside in the world give us holistic and coherent perceptions. Because perceiving is for doing, our senses work together to help us navigate and interact with the world around us.
The reason why we engage in so much effort to come up with perceptions that are as accurate as possible is that appropriate and responsive action relies on reasonably likely interpretations of the world. As in the general perceptual process, perception and action are closely tied to each other, and that is no surprise because these two processes are also linked inside our brain. After visual information has reached the brain through the occipital lobe, these signals are then sent down two pathways depending on what information they contain. The ventral system, called the perception pathway, takes visual information and seeks to perceive, recognize, and identify what's going on around us, while the dorsal system, or the action pathway, guides our behavior, determines locations, and seeks patterns across time, thus allowing us to put our perceptions into useful actions. The close connection between the ventral and dorsal systems and their corresponding consequences on perception and action allow us to mirror the behaviors and predict the intentions of other people. Through the mirror neuron system, a set of neurons that respond when we observe others' actions, we are able to perceive what objects others use to complete a task while also representing the actions or steps that people do to reach their goal. At the same time, the brain is also able to pick up on why people do particular things such that we can associate the objects that people use and the actions that they do with the goals or reasons that motivate these behaviors. It's because of these abilities that modeling or observational learning is possible. We attend to others' behaviors, perceive and remember the actions and objects they take, learn about their intentions, and replicate the task if we are able and motivated to do so. Similarly, Gibson explains in his ecological theory that direct perception helps us to identify not only what objects are present around us, but also what purposes they serve. He calls these affordances, what things in the environment can offer us to complete our goals. In addition, affordances can depend on our physical situation and psychological or physiological state. The same thing can serve different purposes depending on what we need or intend to do. For example, if you see a flat surface supported by four thin posts, thus propping it up from the ground, you can say that it's a chair through direct perception. Then, if you're tired, the chair affords sitting. But if you're carrying something and you need to put it somewhere except the floor, the chair affords supporting objects. Perception and action also work together by helping us navigate the world around us. Visual imagery refers to our mental representations of objects, scenes, and the relationships between them. We call them representations because we can imagine and manipulate objects despite not having them physically around us. The functional equivalence hypothesis says that though visual perception is not the same as visual imagery, we use the same neural mechanisms for both because they save the same purpose, to help us locate and use objects. So, visual images can be scanned, rotated, and scaled inside our heads, much like what you do when you open an image file on your computer. For example, if you imagine a dog right now, you can scan the dog to look at its eyes, then feet, then tail. You can rotate the dog so you're looking at it from the top or bottom. You can scale the dog to zoom out on its whole body, or zoom in on its face when it's begging for food or belly rubs. One interesting thing is that we differ in how we represent object relationships inside our head. Some people use spatial or depictive representations, where object relationships are stored in memory as if you can manipulate them like digital pictures. For example, look at where you are right now then take a mental picture. Close your eyes and scan the mental image of your room. You can see in your mind's eye how the room is organized as a new life. Meanwhile, others use propositional representations where relationships are indicated by abstract symbols like nouns and prepositions. In this case, when you look around, you could describe that the laptop is on the table, the phone is in your hand, the lights are above you, and an overspeeding car blaring unpalatable music is driving in the road outside. Spatial and propositional representations are also useful when we develop cognitive maps, our mental representations of larger spaces, routes, and directions that are useful for navigation. To make cognitive maps, we take into account our estimates of how far away locations are from each other, our survey knowledge, the pathways that connect places, our route road knowledge, and key features that mark a location or the directions to reach it, or landmark knowledge. Landmarks can be one of two types, non-decision point or those found along the middle of a route, and the more crucial decision point, found at corners or intersections where you can make turns. 
Filipinos are really fond of landmarks. They don't say, in 500 meters, turn right, as in survey knowledge, or go straight down Kalayaan Avenue when turn left at Balanta Street, as in route road knowledge. Instead, we like landmarks and propositions. Pagbilang ka ng tatlong foot bridge sa ikatlong foot bridge may bakery. Hindi pa dun. May pharmacy sa susunod na kanto. Pag umabot ka dun, nagpas ka na. I-turn ka tapos itanong mo na lang doon sa katapat na sari-sari store kung saan nakatira yung mga de Los Reyes. The footbridge and bakery are non-decision point landmarks that indicate that you're still on the right track, while the pharmacy and the store are decision points that mark important turns, or at least inquiry desk that they should have just told you to look for in the first place. Taking all of these together, visual imagery and cognitive maps help us in wayfinding, our ability to navigate by following directions, going through routes, and making turns to reach our intended destination. We do this by orienting our body or vehicle toward the target location and using that perspective as the compass around which all directions are understood when we orienting to stay in course. We call this the visual direction strategy. And as we find our way, or maybe getting lost here and there, we do spatial updating to keep track of our position within the environment while in motion and find ways to get back in route. You notice that, so far, we've been focusing primarily on vision. Cognitive psychology is quite guilty of focusing on vision and research while neglecting the other senses. Sight is quite easier to study than hearing, touch, and taste, so that's one of the reasons. To make it up to you, we'll close perception by looking at how the senses work together. Multisensory integration refers to how our brain binds features to create coherent experiences, not only within one sense, but also across senses. One example of this is flavor a complex multisensory experience made possible by the orbitofrontal cortex in the brain. This area integrates the chemical characteristics of food like taste and smell, while also incorporating other features like texture, temperature, sound, and appearance. British experimental psychologist Charles Spence actually has a long history of research in this field. For example, this research group conducted many studies to adjust the pitch, loudness, and texture of potato chips, so they would give out the most pleasant cracking sound when chewed. His team also did studies on wine and music, coffee and mug color, and cakes and the type of plate they're served in. Formally, he says that senses interact because of cross-modal correspondences, or how our experiences across senses correlate with each other, due to structural, having similar physical properties or patterns of neural activity, statistical, occurring together based on regularities in the environment, or semantic similarities being described using similar terms in our culture. For example, loud sounds are often structurally associated with bright lights because based on the physical properties of light and sound, both have high amplitudes or intensities. Meanwhile, loudness and size statistically correlate with each other because large things tend to make loud sounds. Mice, kittens, and puppies make adorable little noises, while lions and tigers roar quite loudly and scare anyone away from their vicinity. Finally, pitch can be semantically described either by using height, thickness, or pointedness depending on culture. So, sounds with larger hertz values or shorter wavelengths can be described as having high, thin, or pointy pitches. Filipinos sometimes use matinis, meaning pointy, to describe high pitches. In another experiment, speech sounds are visualized to have form. Sounds like K and P are associated with pointy shapes like triangles, while B, L, and M sound like gentle curves and smooth surfaces. That's why new products undergo a lot of market testing. Even if your new food sensation tastes nice, it won't sell anyway if the packaging doesn't give signs of deliciousness and the product name sounds bad. Our senses and previous experiences work together to help us create reasonably accurate perceptions of the world thus allowing us to act and navigate the complex world around us. We're very productive in this lesson covering a lot about perception and action. We discovered what role attention plays in the general perceptual process and distinguished bottom-up and top-down processes. We look at principles of color, depth, size, object, and scene perception using ecological theory, gestalt principles, gist of the scene and semantic regularities, and unconscious and Bayesian inference. Finally, we saw how perception and action work together in mirroring, intentions, affordances, visual imagery, cognitive maps, 
navigation, and multisensory integration. At this point, information in the world has been transformed into data that we can actively work with and use. But we don't just take information now and discard it immediately. Instead, we hold on to it, integrate it with our previous knowledge, and bring it out when we need it in the future. This is the purpose that our memory system serves, which we'll begin to consider in our next lesson. See you then!